do the book. So that's what CCA does for me. It reminds me, it encourages us, it teaches us, it instructs us, it empowers us to do the book, right? And all of the good that we're doing to do the book. So that's what this morning is going to do for us. Incite our hearts. Good morning and welcome. I have one quick announcement. I need 30 people to raise your hand. Quick, 30 people. That's how much room is left on the on-site location. So 30 of you are hereby invited to go to Rebuilding the Walls. You must sign up right after Bible study. Deal? So welcome, good morning, and let's do the book. Amen? And without any further ado, you know what's coming up. Our very own Dr. John Perkins. Good, thank you. Come on, my guy. The most difficult task in in reconciliation is for us to to come face to face with the the sinfulness of our sin. That's the biggest deal in Christianity. And before you can get into the kingdom of God, you've got to repent to come into the kingdom. You've got to recognize that you have sinned and come short of the glory of God, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And Jesus came into the world to save us from our sin, but we got to become conscious of that sin before we can come into the kingdom. Last night was, we have, CCDA, I have, we have, the American church have, we have failed to create reconciliation with the Native American. We've tried from day one with CCDA. But there is no reconciliation. There is no, there is no reconciliation until you recognize the dignity of the people that you're going to be reconciled with and hear their view so we can enter into their pain and then we can begin that negotiation. What we hold, what we hold as truth has very little to do with the initial connection. You have to enter into the pain of the people. That's what happened last night. What we think, because it's not working what we've been doing and what we've been thinking. We got to feel the need and the pain of the people that we want to go through. I've been testing it because people have never heard the pain of the Native American. I just wanted to say that because I've, I've, I've heard, I've heard a, a lot of stir and I wanted to come out and say that I was, I was in and into the pain and I've already done that with the Aborigines, I've done that with the Myris, I have done that with indigenous people around the world, it's not doing well. Colonization have had its deadly effect, of course, it has been the means of a lot of our prosperity and scientific advancement in the world. But we're here, Jesus came into the world to, to save the humanity. And we are stewards of that message. I believe the gospel is the answer to that. The gospel is the reconciling power of God to bring people into the kingdom. And we have the privilege of doing that. I think we need that as a, as a part of our discipleship. I thought I would tie that this morning to our discipleship. We got to hear each other's pain. Uh, America did not hear black people's pain until the, what is it, the Pedimus Bridge in Alabama. When they turned those water holes on and those big horses were stomping all over people. 
then the, the South didn't hear it then. But the national media was there. And out of that came the voter's right bill. Which means we got serious about it. I think we can get serious about reconciliation. We can get serious about, we've been at the edges. It's been a white-black reconciliation. But God is reconciling all people unto himself. In the kingdom of God, there is going to be people there from every nation, every race under heaven, praising God. And, and, and nobody's going to be colorblind. That's another racist statement. Colorblind. It means that you got to look like me in order for me to recognize. That's black and white. I know black felt good when I said that. But I go to all black churches. I go to all white churches. And our all black churches don't want no white folks there. And a lot of all white churches don't want no black folks there. So don't give me that stuff. We're talking about authentic Christianity. We're not talking about comparing ourselves to each other. We're talking about going to the word of God and see that great cloud of witnesses from all nations, all nationalities, all colors, all clans are worshiping God together. That's what the kingdom of God is like. And the church is left here to bear that kingdom to the world. That's what Jesus talked about during those 40 days of resurrection. He talked to those disciples about what the kingdom of God was going to be like and his church that was going to be born uh, after he left was going to be here to reflect that kingdom here on earth. And to that extent, we have failed too. And I think if we acknowledge our failure... And then begin to use the light that God has given us in the gospel. The gospel is the light. It's the light. We don't have to walk in darkness anymore. We can walk in the light of God's reconciling love. And that's what CCDA looks like. I want to say that. Boy, that almost seems like I'm bragging. And I'm like Dizzy Dean. You're not bragging if we can do a little of it. <laughs> and so we're trying to do it. We are serious about trying to break down these walls. Absolutely serious about it. Because there is no virtue and value in racism and tribalism. It's a toll waste. It, 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 it don't contribute nothing to the world but death and violence and hatred. And so we, we are serious about that. And you are serious. That's why you're here about it. You're serious because I think that there's a spirit in us that is telling us this is the day. This is our day. This is our day that we need to do that. Well, I want to introduce. Yesterday I thought that uh, my two presenters set me up. I don't think I need to be set up this morning. <laughs> but I, I'm, I, was set up, I think I was set up last night for this morning in reconciliation. Uh, but here... We have another brother here um, who is a reconciler, who is a discipler. And, and, and I want it in black and white. At least, at least. Noel, you can do the Hispanic stuff. Somebody else can do the Asian stuff. So we want to do it. We want to break down these walls. We want to reflect the kingdom of God here on earth. And, and, and that is a part of what discipleship should be about. He said, go into all the world and disciple the nation. Teach them to observe all things which he had commanded us. And he said, lo, I'm with you unto the end of the world. And so our work is the work of discipling people into this kingdom where that we, the world will know we are Christian because of the love we have one for another. Jason, give us seven minutes of your story. Good morning. It's great to be with you this morning. Um, first of all, thank you. Thank you for your labor of love uh, in reaching out to the most marginalized in our nation. Uh, and thanks to Dr. Perkins, who's given me the opportunity to share not only my story, but this is God's story. This is not about me. 
This is about how God transforms and changes a life. My name is Jason Williams. I'm the urban pastor at Briarwood Presbyterian Church. It's a 5,000 member church in suburban Birmingham, uh, the birthplace of the PCA. Um, it is one of the most influential churches in Birmingham, Alabama, um, and for the world for that matter. But we've got some problems. And uh, my job there, when somebody asked me, what is your job description? I said, it's to radicalize white people. <laughs> and they look at me like I'm crazy, and they say, you're going to get fired in about a week. But that's what God has called me to do. We are focused uh, on the community of Fairfield, which is about 10,000 uh, 10, people there in that community. It's about 90% African American. Uh, eight out of ten fatherless children, 60% high school dropout rate. You, you guys know how it is. Um, kids there don't graduate high school. They graduate the school of hard knocks, end up in gangs, end up in a pine box, end up in prison. But before I get to what's going on in Fairfield, I want to share with you a little bit about how God transformed me. I grew up in the D.C. area. Some of you are maybe familiar with D.C. We just call it the DMV. D.C., Maryland, Virginia. Grew up in a professing Christian home, but what I saw from a church was a bunch of hypocrites and masqueraders who didn't do what Jesus did and taught. They just told you what not to do. So I got out into the world by age 12, and I pursued the lust of the eyes, all the possessions in the world. I pursued the lust of the flesh, the pleasures and the passions. I pursued the pride of life, power, and position. And by age 13, I was a womanizer, fornicating. By age 14, I was selling drugs. By age 15, I was using drugs. By 16, I joined a gang. And by 18, I had brought two kids into this world. Notice I didn't say fathered two kids. I just brought them into the world. And by 19, I was arrested six times and was facing 60 years in prison, three felony counts of crack cocaine distribution. God did an amazing thing. People began, disciples began to pour into my life. And see, I was a white all-American basketball player, so I kept getting chance after chance after chance, which doesn't happen for a lot of guys who got locked up with me. It was one and done for them. So I saw the white privilege. It was real to me. I saw how I would, I would be let off because, simply because of my color. Not because I did anything different than my brother. But in any case, the Lord saved me and brought me to Birmingham. Now, I never would have chosen a million years to come to Birmingham, Alabama. I mean, I had heard the stories, right? And, and, and even today, our state has a black eye. I'm sure many of you are aware of the new immigration law. And my question to my session and my church is, what are we going to do as the body of Christ if we are called to reconciliation, where do we stand on these issues? It's, we've been silent for too long. We've been silent for too long. And as a suburban church, I know some of you have the same question is, how can we engage in the inner city? As a suburban church, how can we, how can we empower people without enabling? And, 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 and I'm sure most of you, you know, are from a church like mine where I realized right away when I came on staff, they have a very paternalistic idea of ministry. It's paternalistic. It's here we are riding on our white horse and we're going to save you people. And that's why I said my job is to radicalize white people because I got 5,000 of them. Pray for me. <laughs> I might be fired after this gets on YouTube. But, but what we have to do is we have to teach our people, see? And I'm not going to tell you things that you haven't heard this week or read in books, but we have to teach our people that first and foremost, it's God's love. First and foremost, it's, it's um, God who demonstrated his love and that while we were yet sinners, he died for the ungodly. It's God's creation ordinance while we do what we do, that every, every human being has inherent dignity that is created in the image of God and in his likeness and is fearfully and wonderfully made, that's, that, that, that just transcends race. 
And it's, and it's understanding God's stewardship principles that you own nothing. God has entrusted you with wealth. God has entrusted you with gifts and talents and you own nothing and you should give it all back to God. Luke 14, you can't come to me unless you're willing to renounce all you are. And that includes your stuff. That includes your stuff. So let me leave you with this. There's a movement that's taking place in Fairfield. And we are now involved in an urban Christian school called Restoration Academy. 275 kids, 90% fatherless, 90% below the poverty level. Last six years, all have graduated and went to college. <laughs> Hallelujah. We're involved in Hope Health Clinic that provides uh, health to a community. We've got a doctor there, such a servant heart that, that, that people who are weighed down with diabetes that can't even bend over to cut his toes. Now, he's a doctor, spent 10 years trying to become a doctor, and he cuts the toenails of people. A servant. That's a servant. Well, let me leave you with this. This is about innovation, right? This is about education. This is Cairo. This is the urban version of John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. This was written not to become a book. This was birthed out of a man's heart, my best friend, Ben Shaka, who was the principal of that inner city Christian school. And he wrote this because there's no good curriculum for urban ministry. There's no good curriculum to young urban kids. Either you have to rewrite it, what's there, you write it yourself. But we'll be right out here at the far table on the end, the MNA table. Pick up this book. It's powerful. We got a leadership guide as well. Thank you for your time, and thank you, Dr. Perkins. Great, great, Love you. Great, great. Thank you, brother. Love you, thank you. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, thank you for what you are doing. Thank you for all these wonderful people that are here from all over our nation. Lord, I pray that we would take advantage of these days and these hours to really get to know each other, but to... Get into these workshops that draws us so that we can learn from each other. We can take these best practices that is happening in all of our nation, that we can bring them back to our neighborhood. And Lord, thank you for Jason. Thank you for his life. Thank you for making him a spokesman. Thank you for leading him through those things and out of those things so he can speak of your grace and your love. Now, Lord, I pray that you would help us here as we go back into first timothy and understand this whole discipleship we ask this in jesus name amen first timothy and i'm doing first timothy because timothy was converted on the paul's ministry he was discipled by his mother and grandmother he did not have a father in in the home and Paul when he was converted and understood him and interacted with him could understand if he was going to be a real leader that he need to have a man a father in his life and, and in that day, a father was responsible, particularly for the first 12 years of the growth and the development. And so it was expected that the, fa- that the son would behave like the father. It was expected that, expected that. And so that's why he said that he was his son. So, so in order to be a disciple or being a disciple, you need to take on those people as your own child, whether it's a, a, a girl or boy. And now you're discipling them in a rounded way. I grew up without a mother and I grew up without a father. The old 70-year-old man who took me on when I was converted um, 56 or so years ago, he took me on as his son, and, I, and he was a Bible teacher. And he taught me with the idea, and he birthed this dream in me that my responsibility and what he was discipling me to be, because he was a Bible teacher, he was discipling me to be a Bible teacher. 
And, and so that discipleship, discipleship, uh, they, so Paul is doing that. We've got to keep in mind, too, that, that Paul was a, got the special revelation of what the church was going to be. And I'll explain that. Because Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church. That was during the life of Jesus here on earth. And the church was going to be born at Pentecost. We understand that. And then uh, the apostle Paul then is the one that has the revelation. You cannot understand the structure of the church without understanding Paul's writing because that was a special revelation given to him. In, in, there are others who have some ideas, they're doing some other, Peter and all of those, but the revelation, and even in the scripture, what we know about the operation of the church. There, there was a model of what the church was to be in the, in the life of Jesus himself, because Jesus, in a great sense, was the church. He was the incarnated body of Christ, of God, here on earth. And the church then was going to be, after his death, burial, resurrection, that, and this is what he talked about more than anything else, that he was going to come again and live in them through the Holy Spirit. And the church would be built upon him. Really, when he said, upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, the biblical idea here is that that rock, of course, is Jesus. And so the church is really the body of Christ. He modeled that out in his early days. He called the disciples to come and be with him. And he kept them over that three and a half years ministering to them. They, in a great sense, was the church. And we're going to see later on, as the church spread out into the world, they're going to be looking back and thinking the way Christ lived with his disciples, and they're going to call them Christians. They're going to call them church people. They're going to stop being the people of the way because they're going to be acting collectively. And what we want to get to this morning is that we are discipling people for the church. We're discipling people. I, I affirm whatever organization you're with. That ought to really be an extension of the church. It really ought to be an arm of the church going out there doing those things that are more difficult to do within the structure and the context of the church the way we have it. But all of our work towards redemption, we ought to be training those people so they can be nurtured within the church. Of course, I know now, the reason I had them here yesterday, the best people who have the best understanding of discipleship is not in the church. They had to go outside of the church and start the discipleship in diversity, navigators. Campus Crusade for Christ became the largest Christian organization that ever existed in the world. And it started out because the college campuses was being neglected. And Bill Bright went on to the college campus after he had been discipled by Miss Mira at Hollywood Presbyterian Church. And that's where she discipled Dick Havison, Billy Graham, and, 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 and Bob Pierce, and all of those guys. The reason they took on the world because they had been discipled by Miss Pierce in her Bible class. In the local church. And so Bill Bright said, could see that they were missing. And Bill Bright went out with a, establishing these on church. Campus, it's Campus Crusade. University. The Jubilee people in Philadelphia. That's where the technique. But what I want to do, and some of those people get into the church and some of them don't. The church is supposed to be there to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Those gifts that is in Romans 12 and in 1 Corinthians 12, those gifts are to be divine. The God divinely restores those gifts within a local church. 
so that those people can equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And we need somebody with all of those gifts, not one individual have all the gifts. Because God departs those gifts within the church as he sees fit in relationship to the need of the people in that congregation. He puts them there. So they can be there to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. We've got to return discipleship back to the church. And even as we go out and take these ministries, we don't supposed to be organizing an inferior organization. We're organizing an extension of the arm of the church in these neighborhoods. So we can rescue the perishing, care for the dying, and put them within the church, the body of Christ. I hear these foolish people say, I don't need no church. I can get it all here on the television. It, this whole Christian life is an incarnated life where we got to touch each other. We got to touch it. We're doing that now in the church. We, we, we are feeling, since we are doing that in the church, that we have to touch each other in the church now. And that's the way it ought to be. We are the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. The church is a collective group of people who are united together in a local community to do the work of God. And then when we send people out, even to start churches, it is that church that puts their hand on the apostles and others and send them out with the idea that they're going to win people to Jesus Christ. And the apostle Paul would not leave a city he would suffer all kind of pain and beating until he could gather enough people in that town to establish a church. The church was to be the continuation of Jesus Christ's body on earth in a neighborhood, in a community. And one of the things that we got to do here urgently is a suburban church. I work with the big churches. You, you're not going to hear me talking negatively about the large churches, although they are doing a lot of negative things. <laughs> because I want to now, I want to now mobilize those churches and to take their resources and start planting churches in these very needed areas. These, all of these poverty programs have worked. And all of these church Ministries, apart from the church, is not working that well. We need to understand that there needs to be that body of believers. And that we are winning and deciding. Lundell is an example. I'm not saying that because Wayne and I are best buddies. He stumbled upon this. Most times he'll say that I t taught him how to do that and I didn't know how to do it myself. But I take it though. I take it. It makes, me a, it makes me a little bit more acceptable when the people say that. But what happened there, they started a, a, a ministry. It could have been an isolated ministry, Hope House. But what Hope House is doing is finding these people like Jason who have been burned out, out of prison in jail and bring them into this house that is provided by the church and putting some pastors around them and nurturing them so that they can fit as leaders within that church and within that community. God blesses our obedience. In fact, God blesses just a little bit of our obedience. Faith is like a mustard seed. And if you obey God just a little bit, then he adds to that. Well, I'm amazed at the life of Abraham. He's called the father of our faith. And God told him so clear what he wanted him to do. And Abraham did just a little bit of it. And God just blessed him. But he came to the place where Abraham was doing it all. Abraham was doing it all. He was willing to put his own son on all. He was willing to give it all. But it took 25 years for God to nurture him into that place. Somebody said yesterday, this is not instant stuff. This is the stuff he said to Abraham, get thee out from among your kindred and from your father's house and I'll make you all of this. 
he went and took his whole family with him. And he messed up, the whole family was always messing up, always messing up, Lot was always messing up, always messing up. But then when they separated, God got, talked to him now, and this is what he says to him. Now I'm ready to do for you all of this that I call you in this land to do. He said, all I want to do now, you've been walking in the land, I appreciate that. But he said, now Abraham, walk before me and be sincere. Walk before me and be sincere. Now Abraham becomes the example of faith. He started out believing a little of what God had said. And God began to lead him. That's the first thing you have to do. You don't have. That's one of the things that the more education people get, and I want people to be educated, but they can find so many intelligent reasons not to obey God at the beginning. And if they can't know all that God is going to do before they go, that's a good excuse for them not to go. And that's not faith at all. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. And where faith is affirmed is when you begin to see sparks of that what you hope for. And that's where the joy comes from. Joy comes from great expectation. In fact, it comes from a little realization of expectation. That's what joy is. And the Christian life should be looking back and seeing what God is doing as we look forward to what he's going to do. But we need to see a little bit of that. And that gives us the joy to persevere on to do the work of God, to do the work of, work of God in the world. So I, this is so important, this is so important. Now, what I want to do, I want to, so we are discipling people to disciple people to be in the church. We need to, the church was shaped after Jesus' discipleship and, and, and because the elders in the early church were the apostles. And then God, of course, called the apostle Paul who attacked the apostles and began to run them out of Jerusalem and he called them to make them, make him the church planner and gave him the revelation of the church. So what I want to do this morning then uh, here is, um, is let you look at what are some of the virtues that go into a disciple. I think we need to get there now here. And, and, and I'm, I'm taking advantage of these good books you, you know, that's why I, this discipleship book, I want you to take, I want you to buy it. I'm recommending this book for, for you to carry back to your home. I, I'm recommending uh, uh, Beauty in the Desert. Uh, uh, Bruce Ard is, a, is an excellent uh, navigator, is one of the great discipleship organizations in, in, the, in the country. We need this. This is what we want a CCA to be. We want a CCA to be a place where you could come and you could get these ministries related to CCDA, but related to our mission that we have here. And I'm so glad that in a verse, we, we got a book table, there's a lot of book tables. Be certain to go to my book table because you can get with justice for all, let justice roll down, and all those other our book tables. But boy, we are glad to have all of these people here. We want them here. We're not in competition. We want you to leave with good reading stuff that you can go back home and, 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 and to read. But I thought what I should do is now at this time is lay out what a disciple looks like, or better yet, what are the ingredients then that go into a discipleship that makes you a disciple and what makes navigators so good. Once you become a navigator, you're a navigator for life. I like that. You're called for life, and you're called for life. All of us are called to be in disciple making us a lifetime. And every one of us are called to that. That's the one grace that all of us can have, is participating in this great enterprise of making disciples. You're going to see that when you come 
at the great wedding feast of the Lamb. You're going to see that. You're going to have a huge crown that God has given you for your faithfulness to discipleship. And you're going to discover there you wasn't worthy. You're going to lay that trophy down to where it belongs, to the one who loves you and who calls you to be a disciple. That's what we're here to be. We're here to be disciples. And so what I'm trying to do this week is to say, let's don't make them Christians too fast. Let's make them disciples. And then let's show them how to be like Christ. You know, so we, being a Christian is saying you're like Christ. You, know, you, haven't, you don't know the virtues to go into that. You don't know what it looked like. And what I'm going to do now with the next few minutes that I have, I, I want to then show you what a disciple looks like. Now you can see that in the disciples themselves. But you don't see the philosophy. You don't see the principles that makes us disciples. And so in your Bibles this morning, open them to Galatians chapter 5. Go to Galatians chapter 5. This is serious. Galatians chapter 5, and we're going to also see it repeated. And I want to go to First Peter 2 to repeat it because Peter is going to say it a little bit more profound than even the apostle. Because Peter is going to say, if these virtues are in you, if you got these principles in you, they will make you that you will neither stumble nor fall. And they will prepare you not only for this earth, but they'll prepare you to enter into the kingdom with joy, with joy. So this discipleship is a lifetime task. You get Galatians chapter 5. Uh, let's look at, you need to compare the, the fruit of the Spirit with what's not the fruit of the Spirit, or better yet, we need to compare the fruit of the Spirit with the lust of this world that trips us up. And the Christian needs to know this, to need to know what trips us See, what trips us up said all of the sin, all of the sin that is in the world comes from three basic principles. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. And boy, in my teaching, the hardest thing for me to overcome or get people to see is that individuals can't see pride. It takes divine act of God for people to see pride in their eyes. In, in the, we ought to claim, as you said, we ought to claim that we are proud. And we ought to be recovering proud people and recognize that it's always there. We, that's why I like alcohol and animals. Recognize that you got it for the rest of your life. And it's right there all the time ready to jump on you. Jump on you. We ought to be counting the days we didn't have it. <laughs> so let's go to Galatians chapter 5. This is what a disciple would look like. This is called the fruit of the Spirit. And the idea here, you can know the person, the tree, by the fruits it bearing. And this is the, these are the virtues that go into that. But let me give you, the, give you the what trips us up. This is important because it's so big. Look what he says in verse 16, it begins here. The, the Christian life is called a walk. It's called a way. You know, so it's a walk. And, and so, we're, and, and the walk in discipleship is to walk together. To walk together. And discipleship is having somebody in your life that you are not making total decisions on your own. You, you, you know, I, I have been privileged to live with one of the toughest women in, in the world. Uh, in, in the world. But the one thing about it, is that I don't make big decisions without her agreeing. It has been the best, if you'd ask me, what have helped to guide me in life. I don't make big decisions without her. I found a lot of reasons. I find that she's right most of the time. 
But on the other hand, I know I got a helpmate when she agree. When she agree. And, and when she agree with me, it, it, it's almost going to happen. It's almost going to happen. Because we want to commit our life and our resources to the vision that God has given us. You, you know, because God's promise, if it's building the kingdom, we're going to be rewarded. And that's faith. I like that part about faith. Listen to what faith is. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of not. And that wasn't the verse. He that comes to God, faith, he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that doesn't just seek him. Which means then that what you are hoping for putting your energy and your sacrifice behind it, you can possibly achieve it. And if you're a leader then, a leader is a person who gets other people to share with that vision. A leader is a person who gets other people to do what the leader won't done, and they do it because they want to, because they are sharing a mutual vision with the person. A leader is a person who can turn vision into passion and then get other passionate people to join with them and achieving that vision in life and that's what the end of discipleship is is for you to be a leader that's the idea this is a leadership uh, talk this morning we talking about making disciples who are leaders in the, in, in, in the world now, let's go then and look here at Verse 16. I hope y'all are there. This is a Bible class. Is, I know uh, Barbara Skinner and I was invited to preach out at Seattle Pacific to give a lecture series. And uh, Barbara got up there and she uh, towed the place up. And I, and I had to come behind her. And I like, you know, I like that. I like that. I like to come behind people who've done it real well. You, you know, I got up there. So I wasn't afraid to get up there. But I got up there and said, now, this is a lecture series. This is not a preach-all. <laughs> because you remember that, Barbara? I said, this is a lecture series, not a preach-all. I mean, don't expect me to preach as good as her. <laughs> you know, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to build a, a philosophy of ministry. You, you know, I'm, we're going to build some principles here. Uh, what Barbara has done, she has got y'all up on a high. <laughs> I want you to stay on that high. <laughs> okay, let's, let, 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 me, let me just get you here. This is fun. This is fun. Uh, here we have it, verse 16. This is the apostle talking here. Uh, this I say then, walk in the spirit. Man, that's the idea here, is the full flow of the spirit in our life. Is allowing the spirit convict us and the first thing the spirit ought to do what it was sent to do is it convict us of sin get that right in your head spirituality is not pride I, I, I see this sometimes I, sometimes I see and I hear my wonderful people who speak in tongues I like speaking in tongues and I pray for God to let me speak in tongues he haven't did that yet if he speak in tongues I would want him to let me speak in English because I don't do that. I speak uh, Ebonic now. So if, 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 if you hear me speak in English, you know the God that made me speak in tongue. Yeah, 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 in, in, in love. And so I, so I, so I but, but, but sometimes I hear my people, when they feel with the Holy Spirit, they get so set up with something to me that looks like pride. That ain't what the Spirit is to do. The Spirit didn't come to do that. The Spirit came to convict you of sin and to lead you and to guide you into truth so you can be people of truth, people of honesty, people of integrity. That's where we are going. That's where we are going. That's the end of discipleship. Let's go ahead. Let me, let's look at it here. Uh, this I say then, walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And the Spirit for the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, 
And these are contrary. They are with you. They are there one to another. So that you cannot do everything you want to do. You, you, we, we, the Spirit is trying to help and guide us into obeying the will of God. That's what we Christians are here to do, not our own will. Those are the things you want to do. You want to do. You're going to make your calling God's will, whether or not God's will or not. You're going to try to do that. And so the Spirit is here to lead us and to guide us into truth. And then to convict us as we go along of our sin and our wonder. Uh, uh, my song in the morning is, I get up. I'm prone to wonder, prone to leave this God I love. And so every day I say, Lord, take my heart and seal it. Seal it to your throne. But I'm prone to wonder. I need help. I need the consciousness of God's spirit in our life, in my life, so that we won't be pulled away by the lust of the, of, of the flesh. And so he says here, here, so that we can do the thing that we would. Verse 18 says, but if we are led by the spirit, you're not under the law. The law is the rules and the regulation that's supposed to help you to do that. But the law couldn't do that. The law failed. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sent his own son here. Now he sent his son. Now we can fulfill God's will because God's son and his spirit is living in us. Look what he says here then. Uh, we're led by the spirit. Now the works of the flesh are manifested. These are the works of the flesh. Uh, boy, you won't hear this much anymore. Adultery, fornication, they at the first, and they have been erased from our life in the society. Even when we talk about homosexual, we talk about abortion, we talk about all those things, we done left all that stuff behind. I'm not making a judgment on that right now. That ain't what, this ain't my thing. My thing this morning is discipleship. So don't come ask me about what I believe about all that. That ain't my thing. But what I'm only saying here, that that has left fornication and adultery out. The conversation is already beyond that. Abortion and all of those is beyond that. That didn't already happen. You need to understand that. You need to understand that. And now you don't get me onto that secondary conversation. I'm right now talking about the, how we can avoid some of this. We got to put up some preventions and stuff. We can't just cure all these people who are being addicted. We can't cure them all. We don't have enough resources. We got to come up with some kind of plan, sort of like we tried to do in Pasadena. We decided that we were going to stop the gangs in Pasadena where they was killing each other at least five at a time, but two or three getting killed. What we had to do that, we had to say, here, we're going to get us some eight-year-old guy. And in seven years, we're going to drop the gang. It happened. It happened because the gang leaders got in there about 12 years old. And we had them there. And so we was able to drive the game. We had to end up building a school. We had to end up doing these kind of things. But we got it. And that was prevention. That, 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 that was bringing a stop to it. And so most of our resources are used on the symptom. We need to now bring some resources to bear on the prevention. And then we need to put these people in the church. And the church needs to be the nurturing people. That nurture each Let me continue here. Here, let's get through with this. Now, now the works of the flesh have manifested these: uh, adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, luxivity, uh, witchcraft. And boy, I hope I had time for witchcraft. I wish I had time because we're practicing witchcraft now. We're preaching witchcraft. I, I think the lack of understanding and reconciliation makes us practice witchcraft. I think we try to make the church think that they are doing something they're not doing. That's either hypocritical or witchcraft. That's the only way you can get to that. Because we're trying to get other people to believe that we are doing something we're not doing. And that's witchcraft. Well, something's going to happen that's not really happening. That's witchcraft. 
And, and I really think this reconciliation leads to that. And, you know, I, I talked to Africans in Africa. I talked to the people in Rwanda and all that. I met a few years ago with all the uh, Nobel Prize winners in, in, uh, in, in reconciliation. And they say that when people get this racial bit and start practicing genocide, they go mad. They don't know why they're killing their cousin. They don't know why a Catholic is killing a Protestant and why a Protestant is killing a Catholic. They, 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 go, they go wild. That's the, when you practice something too long, I believe that's what demon possession is. You, you begin to believe that you're doing the right thing and you begin to feel like you're accomplishing something. And Jesus did more de casting out demons than he did anything else. That had to do with people that went beyond belief. They thought it was real. They thought wrong was real. In the, let me finish this here. They, they tease me about that, don't they? They tease me about that. No, okay, uh, but you know, I have to, I have to keep... Uh, people listening, particular white people. <laughs> I had to keep them listening, you, you, you know. Okay, let's go back here. Let's go back here now. It says, okay, it, says, it tells us all these things, and witchcraft, hatred, uh, envy, murder, drunkenness, all these things, those are the uh, uh, work of the flesh. And Paul said, I've told you before, in past time, I'm also telling you again, the people who practice this kind of stuff is not going to inherit the kingdom of God. It meant that they hadn't been fully converted. They hadn't been fully converted. Now we come to our teaching this morning, and we'll close with that. This is where we are. This is where we was on our way to. I got four minutes. I'm doing okay. I'm doing, 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 I like this plot. Uh, uh, four minutes. Uh, look what he says. He said, but the fruit of the Spirit, but the fruit of the Spirit, my memoirs is going to come out pretty soon, and they're going to say love is the final fight, but love was the starting point. Love was the starting point, and love is the beginning, and love is the end. That's what the gospel is about. That's what the mission of the church is about. The mission of the church is about demonstrating and showing to this world God's love, not just in words and in tongue, but in deeds and in truth. And so what it says here, he says the fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy, joy, gratitude, joy, that God has called us out of darkness in this marvelous light. Then we have peace, peace with God, peace with each other, that peace that surpasses understanding. Uh, long suffering, suffer long. That has been a weakness of mine. Uh, not willing to, to have the patience that I need and patience with people. Uh, God still have to help me with that. He had to help me with patience. Uh, with people. And so these are the first uh, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, goodness, goodness. I like David's song. Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Goodness, faith, faith, people that believe, people that are reaching, reaching out. People who are living by faith, the just shall go on living by faith. Temperance, temperance, temperance. That's what I was doing this morning when I opened. I opened this morning with temperance. I know people was going to be upset about the, the Indian theology. You got to know what you are dealing with. Don't you, you don't have any sense. You're going to walk into something and think you're going to help people and you don't know those people? And, and we can put our fundamental stuff up there too quick. We can come to a conclusion too quick. And that's what we're talking about here. Tempest is not coming to a conclusion too quick. And temperance is suffering long. 
temperance is listening it through. Don't make your decision till you get enough information. Do your due diligence. That's what temperance is all about. And so we get the little old half truth and we go throw it up in people's face as whole truth. And we block truth out. I am, ain't you glad that Albert Einstein uh, didn't believe that you could find God so easy? Most of this nuclear stuff. I go into the hospital thing, all of my, all of my machine now is nuclear machine. These, all of them are nuclear. I went to the hospital last week, they doing some more tests on me. And this nuclear stuff, that's Abbott Einstein and his team. I'm, I'm glad that he didn't come to the conclusion that God was this simple God, that God was complicated. And the end of his life, he began to say, it's something out there. <laughs> it's something out there. We come to the conclusion too quick. We need to become students of the Bible. We need to become learners. And this is an ongoing, right, let me finish for the day. <laughs> Meekness, temperance. And then he says, of such there is no law. Now let me show enough conclude here this morning. Listen to what Peter said. First Peter here. First Peter, what time is gone, I'll have to go this much over uh, here. Uh, verse 3 of first of second Peter says something here so profound. Y'all need to read this. Listen to what it says. According to his divine power has given unto us all things that pertains to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. Whereby are given unto us exceedingly great promises, precious promises, that we might be partakers of that divine nature. The fruit of the Spirit is God's divine nature working in us and having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And besides this, Peter says, give all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge tempers, and to tempers patient, and to patient godliness and to godliness, brotherly love, and to kindness, love. For if these be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But if you like these things, you are blind and cannot see afar off and has forgotten that you was purged from your own sin. Wherefore, brother, brothers and sisters, give all diligence to make your calling and election sheer. For if you do these things, you will never fail. This is what a disciple looks like. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness and grace. Thank you that we could be together this morning. Bless these words. We ask all this in Jesus' precious name for his sake. Amen. Okay. Good morning, family. God bless you guys. How are you this morning? That sounds good. Do you mind if we open up quickly with the words of Jesus? John chapter 15, verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. 
I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I have learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command. Love each other.